Um, hello, welcome. My name is Andrew Burke, the Chief Executive and Artistic Director of the London Sinfonietta. Welcome to this, the third of our Sinfonietta Shorts programmes, uh, which is part of our Lockdown Live series. Um, first of all, just to wish you all well and trust that in this difficult time, you and your families remain well and um, are finding some positive things to keep you occupied while we all go through this strange time of being locked up. But uh, we hope that these events uh, give you some relief and some inspiration and uh, something interesting to experience perhaps for the first time. The London Sinfonietta is an ensemble started in 1968 and we're really committed to playing the music of living composers as well as the great tradition of music written in the 20th and now the 21st centuries. So um, we hope that when we go back to giving live concerts you might come and visit. Um, we're grateful for the support from the Arts Council whose investment in us as a group uh, enables us to um, do the work we do is the foundation upon which we can generate other support and for this particular series we're very grateful for the relationship we have with Lark Music who are an insurance broker who've helped us develop this symphony as a short series over a period of years now um, as well the support of individuals many of you may be outside in the in the world who are listening looking at this might have well donated to us in the past and we're very grateful to you for having made some of these commissions come into being if you want to follow more of our digital work, which we're putting out over the next few weeks, please do subscribe. And there's a button down in that corner of your screen where you can click and subscribe and it means you'll get automatic updates. So we hope very much to see, see you again back at some of the other events we're doing, full details of which are on our um, website. So Symphony to Shorts, they're short um, solo works about five minutes long as a way of introducing people to new music, to the composers that who are writing it today, and uh, of course to the musicians of the London Sinfonietta who are world experts in performing and interpreting this music. Um, so today you'll hear two of those pieces, one by the composer Samantha Fernando, another by the composer Colin Matthews, who both join us in a moment, um, and then there'll be an extra item at the end, another short work by Samantha that came out of a different commission that we placed with her some years ago. But first, I'd like to introduce you to everybody else who's with me on the call. I hope they are at least. And uh, Michael Cox, who's the extraordinary principal flautist of the London Sinfonietta, who also has the principal position with the BBC Symphony Orchestra, Academy of St. Martin in the Fields and the London Mozart Players. So it's great that he's joining us from his home. And with him will be on your screen any moment now, um, Samantha and Colin. So just say hello to everybody. I hope you're all there and your microphones are working. Hello. <laughs> right, I'm assuming that's working. Good. Um, so uh, to start with, hello, Samantha. And um, it's a great pleasure to see you. Um, your solo work for flute is called Kinosphere. Um, I believe it was created in 2014 as part of this Symphony of the Short series that we've been commissioning over the years. Um, and Samantha, we first met you uh, as one of the composers on one of our composer development or support schemes called Writing the Future. Um, but since then, you've created a number of different pieces for us. Um, can you tell me more about your relationship with the group and a little bit about the piece as well? Yes, it feels like a long-standing relationship now. It's been, it's, um, yeah, it's been some years. And this was one of the, yeah, one of the earlier pieces that I, that I wrote for the Sinfonietta. Um, the piece I wrote for Writing the Future was um, positive negative space which was for a um, small mixed ensemble um, and that was yeah that was the first thing I wrote for the Sinfonietta um, and then this was yeah this was shortly after um, and it's really lovely for it to have another outing like this because um, uh, it was yeah written as written especially for for Michael um, it came about I, I think at the time um, you asked me what instrument I'd like to write for um, and I said flute because I am a, a lapsed flautist. Um, and I think I had had it at the back of my mind that I would, I, you know, I'd had some ideas of things that I'd like to do on the, to, to explore with the flute. And, and this seemed like a nice opportunity. Um, there's also that benefit if you're, you're writing a solo piece and, it, and you, you play it, you can try things out quietly at home and <laughs> um, uh, see what works. Um, and so, yeah, it, it, it was kind of born out of that. And I feel like it's, uh, um, there's, there's two short pieces in Kinosphere. And then um, I've, I've sort of 
felt like that. I mean, I still have other ideas. I feel like there's like a, it, there's more that I want to do with that. I was talking to Michael about this the other day. Um, it sort of triggered something for me about, and I think there are other composers that have done have done things like this, like Chirino, having sort of catalogues of um, solo pieces for flute. Um, so that's, yeah. Um, would you like me to say a little bit about, about the piece itself? If you talk about that with Michael, but can I just ask you about the title? What does the title mean? Or mm. Yeah, so kinesphere. Kinesphere is a, a term from, choreo it's a, a, from choreography um, coined by um, Rudolf Laban. And it means um, it's the space around your body. So if you're standing either on two legs or one leg, um, it's how far out you can reach from your body with an extended limb. So it's, it's kind of your, I suppose in a way, it's your kind of da dance space um, if you're in a kind of stationary position, the space that you inhabit. Um, I thought this was quite an, uh, uh, an interesting thing to, ex uh, to explore musically, this idea of extremities um, and how far, yeah, it's kind of the reach of the instrument um, in different in different musical parameters. So, so Michael, you must celebrate um, any piece that allows you to show off what the flute can do, and I think this works better. Uh, absolutely. Um, it's really interesting, though, because um, for me, the, there's an overriding kind of vibe about the piece, um, and it's it's got this sort of feeling of sweet melancholy, which I absolutely love. And I was going to ask you, Samantha, whether that's common to all, most of your work. <laughs> this is a slightly reflective a feeling it puts me in a kind of reverie um, <laughs> playing it. I wonder it's that's so interesting you say that it, I think that it's hard for me to have the distance to say whether um there is this kind of reflective melancholy <laughs> in my music but I'm quite happy that you observe that in it I don't know that's quite a um there's something about it that, that reminds me a little bit of Dowland or something like that. I mean, obviously, it's hugely different music, mm. but, but just touches me in that same sort of way. And um, I was wondering I, as well what your main influences were or are probably very diverse. Yes, I think it changes from piece to piece. But now that you mentioned it, I mean, I think I often use the term like the expressive term reflective um, in my scores. So yeah. I think probably that is something that I, um, that is characteristic of my music. Um, I think I like, I like there to be um, uh, often, you know, I, I quite like a kind of spacious quality to the music. Um, and yes, I think influence, yeah, influences are very hard to talk about because I think it really does change from piece to piece. There are, yeah. it depends what I've been listening to and what I've been reading. Um, but I, I, yeah, it's very, I, I think sort of style or trends within music I, for me I find it's hard to talk about I just don't I think I'm too close to it to be able yeah. to, to, to define it very clearly. Do you think it's more a case of osmosis that you drink it in and yes. always wonder about that with composers you know? I think so I think there is a kind of sense that you take in a lot of different kind of stimuli um well I think all the time and then these things kind of get refracted um, through the kind of your own lens of how you write and, and what comes out. And I don't, yeah, I, I don't think you necessarily always have that much control over that. It just, these things all filter in in different, in different ways. Yeah, I was going to ask you if you had actually played it on the flute, knowing that you're uh, a flute. <laughs> and it sounds no, like you have. No, I mean, I, I think fragments, but not some of the, no, not some of the tricky bits. <laughs> <laughs> Very wise. <laughs> um, so um, I was going to ask you, how did it happen to be in two movements? Do you remember back? Um, yeah, so this is, I was slightly nervous about the fact you're, uh, that I'm going to have to talk about these. You know, when you've written it many years ago, it's sort of, it's hard yeah. to remember how the process, the process worked. Um, I think I wanted there to be, a, not, I, I wanted them to be kind of two, two facets of the same whole. Um, so yeah. then they're, they're not um, deeply, I don't think they're deeply contrasted. It's not necessarily there's a kind of a, a scherzo and a slow movement or something like that, but they are, yeah, they are two, two sides of the same whole, but they explore maybe different extremities of the instrument um, in terms of maybe, yeah, register and speed um, at, at different points. So I guess they are, yeah, that kind of idea of kinesphere, that kind of exploring the range um, for those different parameters, maybe if it is different for each movement. Yeah, and it, it's not for me to, um, uh, you know, to layer things on top of 
what your own feeling about the piece. <laughs> but it's quite interesting really also like how um, performers perceive and get a, a hook in. And I'm just really fascinated with both your piece and, I, and Colin's as well. It's just how much you've left for the performer. Um, and I was thinking that so much of contemporary music is so carefully uh, structured and so precisely written on the page. And both you and Colin, much to my joy, wrote the word freely on the part, <laughs> which is probably a risky attitude to take. Um, but, um, but it's so, so nice. And so I was wondering how you feel about that sort of composer performance, uh, performer collaboration and mm. how much you like them to ha inhabit that space. And Oh, I love that. And it makes me so happy that you said that. I, I think it's really important. And you said, oh, far be it for me to layer on top of what, you know, layer, layers of meaning from, I want you to do that. I want you to bring, bring something yeah. to it. And I left, and I think I deliberately left that space. And I think it's a very, um, uh, positive thing that I'm so happy that you that it is for you because I think you you know how to fill that space and you you do bring a lot to the piece where the where there is where I have left um kind of yeah this yeah I guess it's yes yeah, it's expressive space you you bring something to it so um I I'm I'm all for that and I think if you're there's a danger in being too too prescriptive and it, it, it's sort of um yeah it's straight jackets the performer um and I, I, I think there's a, you know, there's, there has to be a kind of, yeah, a creative element for the former too. So they feel like they're, they're contributing to the, to that creative process. Well, I think that's lovely. Thank you <laughs> to both of you. Um, and I'm, as a performer as well, one thing I'm very fascinated by that is sometimes when you have something that's so prescriptive and so complex rhythmically on the page, that it's very hard to sound fluent. Um, so I love this idea that actually you can get something much freer um, and not, not just in terms of you know, being free and being given choice, but in terms of freer as in terms of the way it flows, um, because otherwise you get sort of, you feel gear changes and, um, and the sort of mechanisms of, of strong thought rather than an instinctive flow. So it seems beautiful. Yeah. It was just, um, for me, about the two movements, um, I felt that the first movement seemed to be about, within this idea of kinesphere and finding the, the balletic space around you, um, that this was a sort of active searching out. And then for me, the second movement, I felt that I had found that space and I was then existing inside it, um, still knowing the boundaries. But then it was more, you know, that you were comfortable, you had discovered the space. And... Um, but anyway, that was my take on it. <laughs> oh, I that. That's a great interpretation. I think there is de there's definitely something in that because there are a lot of these kind of flourishes um, in the first movement and it's almost like it is marking out the territory um, yeah. Yeah, for, for what comes next. Yeah, yeah. And uh, do you want to have a little look at some of the techniques you've used in the piece? Yes, I think it'd be nice, yeah, just to maybe highlight some of the little, um, the little passages that are particularly interesting, kind of timbrely, yeah. So um, the first thing I can see on the page is a, a marking which you put MV. Could you explain mm. that for the audience? <laughs> Where is it? I'm trying to find it here. Oh, oh. I've uh, got it to hand. It's uh, three lines down. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, I feel like you'd be better at explaining it than me. I wonder if it would well, be... Well, let me explain it then. Yeah. <laughs> you can actually demonstrate it. <laughs> I will demonstrate it. Um, and I love this because you put multi, MV stands for multi vibrato, doesn't it? And, um, but at the same time, I just thought it was so wonderful. So instead of getting a plain note, we're going to get something with very mannered sort of vibrato. Um, but then as well, you put a pitch bend on it, which I really like. So you're going, and then you answer it by something which is breathy. And, I, I think with your inside knowledge, I mean, a lot of people use these as well, who understand about the instrument, but there's something so wonderful about a breathy flute sound, and we're gonna get... So sort of shiver of breeze in the trees, I think. And then I was interested in lower down on the page, you then put overblow, 
And it, was that something you'd experimented or got from jazz or? Um, yeah, it was just something, it was, yeah, <laughs> it's both of those things. Yeah, it's, it's having, I mean, I, I experimented, but was not very successful at doing it myself, but I had, I'd heard it again. Yeah. In, in, um, yeah, in some jazz music and just really loved the effect of it. And so yeah. that, that first one that you demonstrated, that tremolo that was all breathy, that's yeah. kind of a precursor. And then when we hear that tremolo again, it's then okay. colored differently with the, with the overblow on top. Yeah. So this is, we're going to start with the real pictures. A tremolo between E and G. Um, and then gradually I introduced some upper partials, upper harmonics, and then split it all over the place. That sort of thing. Mm, exactly. <laughs> and um, I think that's kind of what we meet later on in, in the last movement. And this is probably worth mentioning because we're not quite sure how audible this is going to be on the live stream, but it ends with something called whistle tones which are incredibly flat, fragile and incredibly soft, are they not? Um, and so you find a note. And then you gradually find just above the head joint, the little upper partials on the sound. It's like very floating harmonics on a stringed instrument. Um, they're very, very beautiful, but quite hard to hear. So <laughs> let's hear what we do. Um, yeah, and um, do you remember how you how you found the idea, the concept of kinesthesia? I had been at a um, workshop for composers and choreographers oh, um, wow. a few months, I think, before, and there had been some discussion about. I was very interested in the idea of notating how musicians um, notate their ideas. But choreographers, I mean, they keep so much, they keep some dancers, they keep so much in their head. It's not like they have, um, yeah. they have so they have things written down. So I was kind of, I'd started doing a bit of reading about kind of choreography. Um, and this was a term that had just had, had again, it just filtered in. Um, and I'd found, because there were some things, um, there were other things, a kind of language that we, that we, we use um, in music, but actually they use in dance, but for completely different means. Um, so kind of the words, um, they talk about dynamics, but they don't mean it in the same way as us. And so there are all these kind of, this, the vocabulary, I was just quite interested by this kind of dance vocabulary. Um, and that's why, that was just one that had, that one had stuck with me. <laughs> sure, and can I ask you one last question before I actually play the piece, which is um, how you, um, when you start off with a piece, how much of that is full planned or is it, does it sort of flow or is it a mixture or what's, or does it vary from piece to piece? Um, it, I do you know, I don't know if it varies that much actually. It feels, it feels new every time. Sometimes I sort of worry that I don't even know how to compose when I first start. I'm just like, oh my goodness, how do I do this? Um, and I think what, so, I mean, maybe it's just like that, that kind of fear of a blank page. Um, and maybe have, so I think what I tend to do is I'm quite process driven at the start. I may have an initial idea and I have my ways of working and I start doing those. And so it's kind of very much led by me and my processes to start with. And then the music takes over and then, the you know, the ideas then dictate, you know, what will come next. And you don't really know. It's kind of a process of uncovering really. Um, rather than I, I for me anyway rather than feeling like I have a kind of architectural plan that I am realizing um I'm sort of uncovering as I go and um, so it is a mixture of kind of process and intuition as I think it is for lots of composers yeah. Um, but yeah I think it, maybe at the start just to get me going I, it's kind of one of those things I maybe like a, you know artists and things maybe just drawing and sketching and I have certain ways that I work at the start that just kind of get get me into the process until I feel like the music can then lead can lead things for sure and if it's any help sometimes I'll pick up my flute and things I don't know how to play that either <laughs> 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 uh, so here's Kinesphere by Samantha Fernando <laughs>
Bravo, Michael. Thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Samantha, for such a beautiful work. Um, Michael, just saying, those whistle tones are very evocative, not least with the beautiful view outside your um, into your back garden with the wind blowing through the trees. It's Aren't I lucky? <laughs> you made music for it, though. It's <laughs> good. Um, Samantha, we'll return to questions and also um, to, to your short extra piece at the end. And please, if, if anybody out there would like to ask Michael, Colin or Samantha a question, please do send me. I think the details are on the YouTube channel or um, via our website or Twitter feed. And I'll make sure they're asked at the end. But now we can turn to, um, to Colin. Um, Colin Matthew, it's really a great honor and pleasure to have you with us. Thank you for joining us. Um, I hope you're surviving this period as well as, as we can. It's, but yeah, very odd. Um, but you've often written for the Sinfonietta, so it was very nice that you were able to accept this commission as well, which was supported by Lark Music themselves. And um, if you remember, which I'm sure you do, we gave it the world premiere of it on the stage of the Festival Hall on the morning of the anniversary of the 50th, the 50th anniversary of the London Sinfonietta itself. Um, on the 24th of January 2018. So it, it, it really lives in the memory as a wonderful moment.
but you and and you dedicated it to the to the memory of Sebastian Bell, who, who used to be the principal flute player of the London Symphony, who had been sadly passed away in 2007, and I think was also your teacher, Michael, is that right? He was indeed, yeah. and an amazingly wonderful and inspirational one he was too. Colin, could you just say a little bit about your relationship with Baz and the Sinfonietta and why you chose this as the, as the way to, to mark our anniversary with us? Well, I go back a long way with the Sinfonietta. I was actually at the second ever concert back in 68. Um, and I think my first commission was in the, in the 80s and uh, Baz was the principal flautist in, in virtually every piece I've written for the Sinfonietta up to 2005 when he retired. And I'd always wanted to write a piece in his memory. And, and when um, you asked me to write a short, which was some way before the actual performance, I mean, this was obviously what I wanted to do, but it was absolutely lovely that it was done on the actual 50th birthday day. That was an extraordinary thing to happen. And the title, Bellwether, can you explain that? Well, obviously it's a play on, play on as Bell. Um, a Bellwether is a leading, uh, a leader, so which is you know, as the principal flute. Uh, it's also given to, um, I think, the head of a flock of sheep, yeah. uh, which is very appropriate for where I am locked down in Somerset and surrounded by sheep. I don't know if anybody's seen, but on the iPlayer at the moment, there's a wonderful um, long TV type program of a sheep drive in the Lake District. <laughs> two hours to unfold as they just follow the shepherds bringing them down. It's, it's fantastic to watch. Yeah, that's right there. <laughs> um, but your, um, I, I, Colin, your, I, I remember a story you once told me about one of the pieces you wrote for the symphony it's called Sun's Dance, which when it was written was the height of virtuosity for everybody involved, but, but now gets played um, regularly by many groups around the world. And it seems as if the virtuosity bar gets just rises regularly and once a piece is out there people then decide to, to master it don't they? It's a, it's a very strange phenomenon that actually pieces seem to get easier even though technically they're still tough and that sounds dance was was terrifying because in fact we weren't able to do it without breaking down in performance until the performance itself um, so it was a pretty scary time. Uh, Bass was playing piccolo throughout in that one. Yeah but we notice now that it's a piece that's played by um, student groups and... Yeah, yes. Uh, I think it's because the challenge is there and people decide that's the new normal. Yep. Um, Michael, it'd be lovely to hear you have a chat with Colin about, about the work and, and how it, how, and your relationship with um, Sebastian too. Um, yes, well, I, the first thing I wanted to ask you is about your love affair with the alto flute. <laughs> <laughs> um, because, uh, you were saying that you absolutely adore the instrument um, and are writing for it more often now than the concert flute. And I wondered what started that process or um, fascination. Well, I think, I think getting to know it, um, but it just feels that there's more potential in some ways in it, you know, just both the, the, the wonderful low notes, but also something that isn't used very much is the, is the higher register, which has a, has, a, has a sort of gentleness and obviously doesn't have the same overtones as the flute. Um, so I've, ju I've just gradually fallen in love with it and certainly as an ensemble instrument now I, I nearly always use alto flute rather than, than standard flute. I, it really amused me in this piece because my standard default thought about an alto flute is something gentle, soft and mellow. For instance... <laughs> You don't do that, Colin. <laughs> well, well, not no, right. Something more virtuosic than that. And also, <laughs> and also the mood. I didn't want, I didn't, the one thing I didn't want to write was an elegiac piece because Bass wouldn't have approved. <laughs> Nothing maudlin. <laughs> no. um, because Bass was not, he, he had such a lively spirit, but in no <laughs> ways was he a sentimental being, <clears> I think you could say. Um, and he loved the rigor of contemporary music, yes. um, but he, he didn't want to, to wallow in things, particularly, I don't think he just loved all that, that electricity and extraordinary sound worlds that came from it. Um, 
And it seems to me that you've completely, and certainly in this piece, turned the alto flute on its head. Um, <laughs> and it's so well written, it's so effectively written. Um, but, um, I, you know, as a flute player, I would say that I've hardly ever known it to be used in this way. Um, so, you know, it seems, feels absolutely, you know, hot off the press and a new idea about how to write for the alto flute. Because for one thing, it's usually lugub lugubrious and low and elegiac, as you say. Um, and then all of a sudden, I mean, essentially, this piece almost feels like a scherzo. Is that a fair comment? Or yes, I think I think that's fair. Yes. Yeah. And I remember playing when I was in the London Symphony Orchestra. I remember playing an enormous scherzo by you, um, which was a brilliant orchestral piece. I remember. <laughs> um, do you remember the LSO doing that? Ah, uh, was that Hidden Variables? I think. Yes. 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 Amazing piece. Yeah. Um, and I wonder whether that kind of, uh, 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 is Scherzo writing something that interests you a lot or is it just part yes, of it, your... Yes, it does. I mean, I, li I like that sort of mood. And also for this, I wanted to write something that was, was although it's precisely notated, I really wanted it to sound like an improvisation, which is why, I, why the tempo marking says we're always with freedom. Yeah. Because um, I can remember when we, we, we met just before the first performance um, and briefly went and um, and I, I saw this with freedom marking and characteristically I thought um, I better not go too mad on that. <laughs> and Colin was going like, I think it could be a lot more free. <laughs> and it's quite a tension really about when you're, because we're so used to being on the leash, as it were, as musicians, it's almost unnerving to be given, it's like when you can't drive properly <laughs> and you're suddenly given a car and told to go and get this all out. Um, because you're suddenly given more freedom than you're used to being allowed. And it's there's something slightly um, unnerving about that, but also joyous. Um, so I've, you know, as I've, you know, I remember you came to another performance I did of this piece and, um, and it's as time goes on revisiting it now, I, I can see more and more potential for that sort of, um, volatility and uh, sort of joyous um, finding the nooks and crannies and what you, how you might shape it. Do you think that any way reflects Baz's character? Was there any caricature or character study in the piece? Not really. Um, I mean, I wanted to do something which would characterize him, but I mean, I, I, it, whatever you start off by thinking, I mean, the piece takes over. Um, Yes, and it seemed to be to be crazy to be writing a solo piece without allowing you freedom. I mean, it's something I've been trying to aim at in ensemble pieces, but it's much tougher uh, when everybody's playing together. But for, for a solo piece, I mean, yeah, it's it's the soloist who has part, the lead. part and parcel. Yeah, mm -hmm. well, it's lovely to have. Um, uh, for one, another thing I thought immediately was that the generally flutes struggle to play short. Um, alto flutes don't even begin to play short. And the very first gesture you write says staccatissimo. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I just thought, mm, I see, I see. This is a new take on, um, and it's been, I must say, great fun to, to, to work with that and to explore the alto in a different way. Yeah. yeah. Um, so um, can you talk us through the piece a little bit? Well, it is, as I said, it's, it's meant to be improvisatory to actually, so pinning it down to a structure would, would be a bit unfair. Um, it actually has the, st the starting point. I mean, and, and I have great sympathy with Samantha saying, you know, staring at a blank piece of paper is, is what we always do. <laughs> I'd used as a starting point, I just took the notes of, that you can get from, from the name Baz, B-A-S, which in German is B flat, A, E flat. Ah, so that's the, the starting point. And I stared at that combination of notes for a long while. And, and the, everything about the piece is permutating that in, in different ways. Um, I thought we might, I mean, it might be worth just playing the beginning, which is low, you know, using the low staccatissimo sound. <laughs> Yeah, um, and that's, I mean, that is, that's the register at which we're used to hearing the alto flute. So if we go to that, where was it? Um, near the bottom of the page, bar 29, um, it's, it's quite a bit higher and un, uncharacteristic. 
I think, I mean, it's a, it's a lovely part of the instrument. I won't ask you before, but I won't ask you to play the screamingly high note at the end, <laughs> almost off the instrument. Uh, but we might, we might go to where I rework the opening um, and ask for you to be intense and buzzy. <laughs> Was that fuzzy enough? Yeah. <laughs> um, I remember once getting an adjudication for competition. This is completely about an aside. And I remember I was very grumpy that day and it put, sounds like an angry bee in a jam jar. <laughs> and I think that that might sum that one up. <laughs> <laughs> um, so actually, I was interesting for me, I'm, I'm intrigued by really short pieces that say so much. Um, and I always think that that's the most, one of the most extraordinary skills. And I must say that there's in this piece. Um, so, you know, I, I would also say for the audience that they're going to experience a lot of different emotional realms in a very short space of time, mm -hmm. because there's, it goes from charm to anger, to whimsicality, um, to something very strident. Um, and then it backs off, so it's very Piero-like or, or um, you know, volatile and um, quite fascinating, I find. Um, and um, do you generally look for that diversity or is it just there's something that happens? Well, I think, I think in, you know, to, to concentrate within a short piece that, that I wanted the, the maximum diversity, but um, it's not necessarily something I would do on no. a large scale. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, Thank you very, very much for revolutionizing alto flute play <laughs> and for writing because uh, people might not realize, but it's incredibly rare to have a piece for alto, solo alto flute. There are very, very few out there. So this I feel is a really important new addition um, to the repertoire. And um, I think I'll perform it now. That's, a, it seems timely. Um, so this is Bellwether in memory of my teacher and um, Colin's colleague, Sebastian Bell um, for Alto Flute. Mm -hmm.
Thank you, Michael. That was beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it really does present in a way that you don't often hear it. <laughs> <laughs> I know you love, Michael, you're very proud and um, dedicated to showing how, uh, what a broad dynamic range the flute has as an instrument and to remove its cliche of being just a sweet layer. It, it, indeed, indeed. It's a bit of a life's mission, that one. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not denying that character within it, but it's just to try and stretch other boundaries and um, explore, you know. I think it's the most insanely flexible instrument um, with an extraordinary dynamic range. And often I think it's much more comfortable to play it in, in a safe zone in the middle <laughs> because security lies there. So it's, it's been a bit of a, yeah, a lifetime's work to try and expand that out and of course that's some of the joy absolutely of contemporary repertoire is that you you know you're challenged in those ways and also can explore new new parameters it's really good that's fantastic um we have some questions coming in which i'll ask now and then maybe we'll end with um samantha's extra little movement um colin that's a wonderful wonderful piece thank you again for having written it for us and Hope it very much goes on and continues to have a life with other performers, perhaps more so now that some flautists might have heard it um, who are watching. Uh, a question for both Colin and for Samantha. You both talked about um, getting stuck occasionally or dealing with a blank sheet of paper. And um, one of our viewers called F.A., and I hope I pronounced that correctly, has a question. Um, do you have some strategies you use when you are writing something and get stuck? Or what are your strategies? Um, yes, I do. I think what I tend to do if I'm stuck is to take a step back and I take um, fragments of musical material out of their context um, and I set myself little compositional challenges with that material um, sort of outside the context of the piece. So what could I do with this? What other things I could do with it? Could I, what happens if I expand this out? What if I tried to make this fragment, say it was a very, very fast little fragment, what if I elongated it all out and did the complete opposite? What if I orchestrated it with completely different instruments? So I just set myself lots of little challenges so that I then generate more ideas. And then I come back to the piece and see if that helps to refresh things and help me to see kind of a new direction that I could go in with it. Thank you. Colin? I think I follow very much the same sort of process. I mean, it's usually, a, a, it's, it's a struggle to get the first notes down and I sometimes just force myself and then work out the potential within those notes. And I might play around with it a, a great deal and whatever happens, I may not use any of that material, but it's part of the process of getting into the piece. Um, and it's just sometimes takes ages. I mean, sometimes I strike lucky, but, but um, I think what, what Samantha said earlier about you know the blank page and the feeling that sometimes you don't have no idea how to compose, it comes back almost every time. Yes. <laughs> Lots of people in different creative fields talk about their work being 95% you know, hard work or 99% hard work and 1% inspiration. Do you, obviously you have processes you can work through to generate material, maybe in the way you've described, do you then have to use that 1% inspiration to say, no, that's it, that, that's, that's the bit of work that I'm going to incorporate. Is it, are you conscious of that switch between the different sides of your work? Well, I don't know about that. I mean, I'm always wary of the use of the word inspiration. I mean, for me, the, the main thing is, is self-criticism, of being aware of whether the material you've got is going to be workable. And I think the, the, the sort of being able to throw things away is actually one of the most important things to actually be able to reject what you've written. Yeah, I agree with that. I also think there's a lot of, it's so much decision making. You're constantly making choices because you are you have so many options that you can choose from. Um, and sometimes that can be the most disabling thing is the fact that there is this much choice and you have to find a way of limiting it. And as, as Colin says, feel comfortable with discarding things, um, which can sometimes be a bit painful if you spend a long time on something and then feel like actually now I have to, I have to put that to one side. I was going to say, I'm, I'm a bit like editing a film. There must be lots of stuff on the floor which mm -hmm. has been chopped out of the final edit, which actually is a beautiful scene or something that could live by itself. Do you, do you have a kind of store of those ideas which have yet to be made into fully fledged pieces? I'm not sure. I, when, I, when I look at the stuff I rejected, I, I think I was right to reject it generally. 
um, <laughs> it's it's um, it's that that's the part of the process. I don't actually sometimes. I mean, things are just going on in my head and don't even get written down. Mm, same for me. I I feel very very similarly. Yeah, it's a lot of rejection going on up here as well. You're just sifting through the different options, and um, before committing stuff to the page. Thank you. Uh, and Michael, a question for you from Amelia. Um, when you're rehearsing and interpreting a piece that has lots of freedom, where does your process begin? Do you, do you dive in and play it straight away with all the freedom it offers or do you take a different approach? Uh, I would say absolutely not. Um, I think I would sort of be respectful of absolutely close notation, but also I tend to come things uh, these days, I didn't when I was a younger player, but from a dispassionate point of view, with an open mind, um, so that I, I sort of meet the bones of it. And then I sort of decide what I think the flesh will be. <laughs> but I think until I've really met the, the, the structural framework that seems to be underlying the piece and allowed its time to kind of work its magic on me, as it were, to sort of like, you know, to feed into my bones and, and to my psyche and just sort of taste it. Um, and I give that due process um, for the first few readings, and then I start. Then I start on a process of um, decision making and also interpretive, you know, um, shaping. Um, but it generally comes from a sort of what I feel to be a, a cautious, respectful <laughs> um, that my first task is to understand and then to interpret. And another question from Natalie: When you're playing high on the alto flute. Are you consciously trying to make it sound like a conventional flute or trying to keep it sounding something different? Um, I, to be honest, I don't have much choice. <laughs> <laughs> the alto flute is a bit of a beast of its own. Um, and to be honest, I think you're, it's very hard. There's something, um, Colin alluded to it actually, there's something about the harmonics when you're high. They are very different. I've never seen a spectrogram um, but you've, I've got one on my phone actually um, and I'm going to do it immediately after this <laughs> and have a look at playing the same pitch on the alto and, and as the flute but I think one would find that there's a very different um, uh, partial spectrum there um, so I think it's it just comes with a very different colour um, so and now I celebrate you know having talked about looking for diversity in flute playing I celebrate very much um, you know, the uniqueness of each of the instruments. Um, if you do that experiment uh, and you can screenshot the results, we could share them with the audience. <laughs> okay, there's a challenge. Yeah. Yeah. I, could, I could probably do the spectrogram, but sharing is, my, is not my strong point. <laughs> not, not technologically, anyway. I'll do my best. Well, we're going to draw this to an end, but have one more performance to round it off. Um, and uh, that's a short piece by Samantha, but that a while ago in 2016, the Sinfonietta played one of your new works called The Journey Between Us, which you decided would be a setting of short stories um, read in the middle of your music, which, which surrounded it. Um, and uh, we performed that at Southwark Playhouse, which was a perfect setting for it. Um, can you just briefly introduce the movement um, before Michael plays it, please? Um, it's actually the opening of the the whole evening is is this um, solo, uh, it's called Lost Things, and um, which is after the, the title of the, the first story by Lydia Davis. Um, Lydia Davis is an amazing um, short story writer. She writes these short stories that are really short, so they, they sometimes they're just a paragraph long, um, and she can encapsulate a whole world um, in this very small scope. Um, and so this piece is kind of a, a little invitation into the evening. So um, it kind of leads the audience in. Thank you very much. Michael, over to you. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Michael. That was a great pleasure. Performance. Thank you, Samantha, for that piece. And um, it's been a really lovely afternoon. Thank you so much for allowing us into your home, Michael, and for your performances. Um, it's been really special and come across really well. I can tell on the internet. So thank you. <laughs> Colin, it's a great honor and joy to be with us. Thank you so much for your piece and for your uh, spoken explanations as well to you, Samantha. And we trust um, maybe you're finding time for writing more works of a similar beauty and an, an intrigue. So um, good luck. And to you out there watching us, um, thank you for joining us. Please do come back next week. Um, and also you'll see other performances we have before that, which are happening on Friday and Monday. So it's all online. But for now, um, uh, take care and we'll see you again soon. Thank you. <laughs>